but I will go ahead and get us started here. Um, again, where I set up in my house, my internet cuts in and out, so forgive me for the little breaks that you'll probably get from me. But um, let me open us up with a prayer. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you are a God of justice one who calls us to account for the wrongs we have done, and yet pours upon us the abundance of your mercy and does not give us punishment for the weight of our sins. Grant that we may be a people who do not hold our faults and errors against each other, but are people that as we hold one another to account may show forth your love and mercy to one another and always be reminded that in each other exists the image of you and of your son, Jesus Christ, and that as we always work and labor together in this world, that we may always see you in the eyes and hearts of the other. Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's see. A couple more people here in the queue. So, welcome, everyone. A couple of y'all are new to the discussion and delighted to have you here. Welcome to those of you who will be watching this on YouTube after the fact. Um, so I have quite a few things on my list to go over for tonight. Uh, for those of you who are new to this, the chapters in the book, if you do have the book are that we had assigned for tonight are chapters three, which is Trials and Tribulation, and, and four, which is the Old Rugged Crawl. So, I want to start tonight instead of me, as I've done the last couple of weeks, with a couple of starting points for discussion. I have a sense that if you've read these chapters, you'll have plenty of material you want to bring up. So I, I'm going to just start by saying, what is something out of these chapters that um, moved you in some way? Uh, and I use that word across the board, moved you for good, moved you for uh, not so good reasons. Um, I just turn the floor over, and if nobody says anything for a few moments, I have plenty of things I can lead us in with, but let's just start. Where, where do y'all want to begin the discussion tonight? With what? You're... I'd like to share. I, I got really emotional. Um, you know, reading the part uh, where he, he was going to be, okay, I need to, I need to remember his name right now. Um, the, the first guy, you know, that, that he, um, anyway, that was charged, uh, for killing the girl on the, um, just on the, um, test, on the you know, on the guy that, that testified that he had done all these things and the guy clearly was not, um, a, a reliable witness in how, I mean, you know, you hear today about things getting twisted around, but this was crazy. And the fact that McMillan was actually at his house, you know, they were, um, they, he was there working on his car. There were so many witnesses and, and it just got crazier and crazier. Um, with, the dude making up all his stories and um and they were wanting him to and it was clearly wrong and then when they got put on death row and oh my god i was just like it blew me away and i i'm telling on myself because i haven't read all of trials and tribulations but today um about an hour before I got on, I read more, and I was just like, oh. So, I'm going to keep reading. It's not going to stop me, but um, it's it's very uh, eye-opening. It was eye-opening for me. Yes, and I'd go on with that, along with that, but it, it's shocking how desperate the authorities were to come up with somebody to blame, somebody to kill, and they they knew <clears throat> he was innocent, but they didn't care. And that then they would get the snitch from the 
prison to make up this story about seeing his truck. I mean, they, they found the least reliable witnesses ever in order to concoct an outrageous story that, um, you know, they just, and, and then the Sheriff Tate, I think his name was, didn't want to review it because he didn't want to look bad. So there, there, there was that impulse, oh, I've got to kill this guy because if I don't, I look bad for having made the wrong decision. I mean, it, it, it's just mind boggling how self-serving, readily self-serving some of these authorities were. It's more at the illusion of law and order, you know, and the maintenance of law and order at any expense. And I was, um, it, it was interesting to, re to, to realize this takes place in the same town that uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, I mean, they keep making that a really ironic thing, you know, and telling, and the white folks and the sheriff and all the people tell him he needs to go to the museum and he can stand right where Atticus Finch did. But here's a black man at, for, for a case that is even more horrifying than, or as horrifying as the fictional one. So... I, I think that was just a whole layer of irony in here that, that was very interesting in this. And um, uh, anyway, just saying, but that's <laughs> Thank you really, saying. really uncanny about the whole thing. Yeah, it it's sort of all downhill from the very beginning. First one, then another, then another. And then when Brian, and he gets his buddy to come from Harvard and come and help him and he doesn't stay a week because he had no clue <laughs> yeah. what he was looking into and he said he, I had no idea it was going to be that difficult. Just the shock also of being down there. I went through this back in 1961 when Eve and I moved to Tallahassee and it was a very big shock to me and it continued to be big and got bigger and it was just um it's hard. When we moved to Tallahassee, which is not perfect, I mean, to Oak Ridge, we were so relieved because we felt as though law was pretty much even here. And it certainly hadn't been down there. So um, we... I had a woman who came in and helped me with housework and stuff. So I had the car one day a week. And we got to be friends. And she told me some horrific things. And she said, these things never made the paper. And she was right about somebody who was registering people to vote and he stopped and went to a motel and this is not in Leon County it was Wakala County and and he went he was there and it was owned by the sheriff this motel and as my friend Josephine said to me you know, it was the kind of place, the kind of motel where people came and only stayed for an hour or two. I said, oh yes, I do know what you mean. And she said, the sheriff came and he was there and he hauled him off and he was never seen again. And you just don't know. But I believe Josephine, who was as bright as I was, and she served people cleaning white people's houses all her life. I, um, I have, a, have a Franciscan brother who um, is now the canon for uh, North Florida. And he lived in, in um, Tallahassee and he was a lawyer and he got interested in prison reform. 
And he told me stories that, I mean, of the, of what the guards did to the prisoners. They would do things like for punishment or what they thought was punishment, put them in a shower and turn on the hottest water they could possibly do until their skin fell off. And a whole bunch of stories like that. He um, actually ran for office and didn't get it. But, and part of it was because he was saying we need some prison reform. And needless to say, the powers that be didn't want to do that. So, uh, to me, the thing that bothered me the most in the story is how they put these guys who hadn't even had a trial yet on death row and right. what they went through psychologically. <clears throat> think, you know, I feel kind of closed in with a nice 500 uh, square foot apartment, but these guys were in a five by eight room uh, with no window and bugs. <laughs> and rat, rats and um i mean that's just inhuman treatment completely i hate to say it but i really wasn't shocked with what i read but uh, what the author has done is he's put a face to these situations and we see the humanity of of these individuals who have been incarcerated and unjustly treated. Um, so I, I enjoyed the book, I really have. Yeah. I'm, I'm really impressed by how clear a writer he is for an attorney. <laughs> but, but I mean, or it's been re-edited or whatever, but it's just very clear, very easy to understand exactly what he's talking about. It's just a it's just a very, very well written book. I was really impressed with that. So I used to work for the TVA uh, legal department for seven years as a legal librarian, and I wouldn't call attorneys generally the most clear spoken people, <laughs> but this guy is. So. Um, thank you. And I just wanted to comment on that. You know, he 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 in his writing his feelings come out. I mean, he's so good at that. I, I don't know if he had help with that or what, but the part where he talked about the old gentleman, you know, that kept staring at him at that meeting. And, um, and then it, it, the guy, he just told him how, you know, how he, you know, how he had felt and being, you know, beaten and, you know, for just wanting to vote there's still a lot of injustices that go on like that if they can get away with it uh i believe but um you know people i guess they try to just stay right under the radar today a little bit but uh the thinking for some hasn't changed a whole lot i don't think so that's all i have to say on that one of the things that really struck me was how intently he listened to each one of his clients. And I think he really built such a good relationship with them um, that, that that really helped the prisoners um, a lot, um, which I, I think they hadn't ever really experienced before. He seemed to really, to really listen to them, and um, and take in their feelings and their situation. And um, I don't know. I I felt like um, from the beginning he just was a good person because he was so intent on building a relationship with them and and truly listening. And I think that's why, if you remember at the beginning of the book, he said that going to law school and all of those classes bothered him and he considered dropping out. He just, he didn't like, you know, the legalese that he was learning. And I think 
it's his personality and his caring for others that informs his writing, makes him more human as a writer, it, displaying his emotions, and then that allows him to be empathetic to the people he serves. So Deb, I think that's why he doesn't write the way normal lawyers do that, you know, use legalese and fancy terms that are difficult to understand. I mean, I think that's why he wasn't sure if he belonged in the legal profession until he found this calling. And that's what really kind of made him who he was. Yeah, I think that the em his empathy is, is part of the calling because you remember when he's with the family right before the execution and it's time for the family to leave and they will not leave and the female warder comes in and she looks pathetic and she looks at him to sort of do something, help me get these people out of here. And, and he falls back on his own resources and starts humming the old rugged cross yeah. and, gets, and gets them moving and gets them out of there. And I'm like, yeah, you know, he's, he's able to come through with things when it matters. The part that really struck me um, is at the end of the old rugged cross uh, with Herbert Richardson right um, before he get, gets executed and he said, um, he's talking to Brian and he said, more people have asked me what they can do to help me in the last 14 hours of my life than ever asked me in the years when I was coming up. Mm -hmm. I read that sentence multiple times and I think that it, it just really it really struck me. One of the things that I, I found interesting was that the prisoners would ask him to help other prisoners. You know, he was there to talk to them and help them. And they'd say, well, you really need to talk to so-and-so and so-and-so -so because their time is coming up sooner and uh, would you help them? So they had kind of a fraternity among the, among the death row people and they seem to try to help each other. I was struck by the fact that the man who wanted the old rugged cross to be sung while he was being executed or before, he had problems. He had disabilities, mental disabilities. And at that time, the Supreme Court had ruled that there was no problem with executing somebody who had mental disabilities. And fortunately, that, has not, that is not the case now. But that it was any time is really appalling. Well, actually, it's still a problem. I worked with a group here in town that was trying to get the uh, state legislature to pass a, a law. And they said that we wouldn't execute people who were mentally challenged, because they do all the time. And they, the, what we finally heard from Randy McNally was that the, they didn't think they needed to do that because the judge can make a judgment that this person is mentally challenged, but they don't. Thank you, Judy. But they have that right. Hmm? So the judges do not execute this right that they have. Right. Thank you. That's discouraging. In the I think here in Tennessee, oh. we do vote for judges, and that was pointed out that whenever you have politically elected judges, judges don't want to appear as being light on crime. So there's kind of a, um, again, it's self-serving to make a judgment to kill somebody if then by not 
making that judgment, you look bad. I mean, you, you've got that, excuse me, I need to get a drink of water, but you've got that problem of, oh, what do you call it, where you, you make a judgment. It's really, what? Self-interest. Yes, it's self-interest, which is really too bad. Yeah, I, I, I was, when he mentioned that about the partisan judge races, I was like, oh yeah, Tennessee does that, because I remember when my mother was running in Chattanooga, uh, she had to run on a party, and I have support from a party, but I always never thought it was anything abnormal, because she always was very clear that this is an apolitical position, even though I have to run by the law on a party uh, platform with a designation next to her name. But then I realized that she was probably one of the exceptions to that because there were quite a few other judges that uh, were beholden, clearly beholden to special interests that would out and out come out and endorse candidates. And what that quickly does is uh, it not only questions the integrity of the court, but it just basically that the judges don't even hide the fact that sometimes they are uh, going to award judgment uh, based on certain criteria that they already have in mind before a person even walks in the courtroom. And that is very much what a judge uh, should be doing. In the midst of this good discussion, one of my items I want to throw out, and it's been alluded to, and uh, Gay Marie, in fact, said it pretty directly, but in both of these chapters, there it just is in, in a little different ways, but there is this theme of we are a people who want to see things that have been done wrong punished. We want to see people who are bad punished. Where does that come from and what's, what do we do about that? Where's this desire to punish people? At, at any cost, like Gay Marie said, you know, oh, you know, we got evidence this guy's innocent. Up, oh, somebody's got to pay. We're going to keep pushing the wheels of the justice system on this case going, no matter if this guy's innocent or not. Where does that come from? Well, I think there's a kind of bean counting. You know, those who want to prove they are tough on crime. Well, we got, we nabbed 69 people and we executed them. Look, we're doing, we're doing a good job, which it, it, to me is a very strange notion of doing a good job. But I, I do think there is a bean counting mentality to certain people. I mean, how do you prove to the public after a heinous crime that something is being done and you don't have to worry about being terrorized, calm down everybody, the police, the authorities are on the job. So there's kind of this problem of trying to assure the public that something is being done, you can trust us, go to bed at night feeling better. And how do we do that? And it's by counting up how many people we capture, how many people we incarcerate, et cetera. So maybe it's a, a scapegoat thing too. Um, you know, let's punish somebody else and then I don't have to look at my own sins. Mm. It's an aggravation of social, I'm sorry, I didn't mean Cut you off. You're, I was just going to say I agree on that. It, I think it goes a lot deeper than bean counting. I know the bean counting does go on, and I agree with you on that. But um, you know, you know, better be the punisher in, instead of the one being punished. I think on that, and and the thing that comes up for me out of this book on that is that electric chair story. Mm -hmm took 14 minutes you could smell flesh i mean come on that's blatant and you can't even have say you seen well, the movie green mile? That, no i have not i i haven't um mm. but 
God bless you. you. You know, you can't even uh, justify that to, by just saying that was the times. Well, come on. You know, we can't keep saying that. Um, so, anyway, that was my take on it. Thank you. Does it, does it go back to the um, to an eye for an eye? To you know, we're getting what Bailey, I guess, was asking. Mm -hmm. where, where does it come from? Is English law, for instance, used to be you know where you could get hung for stealing a loaf of bread or exported or whatever it is, and it used to be in the United States and in uh, and in England as well that a hanging or public execution was like a big social event. And it's like everybody would get together and you have some affirmation of social order and protection, like they're speaking about. It's, it's almost like a group think where, where people want an affirmation of order and protection. And I I'm sorry. I haven't seen it lately, but a while ago I came across an article that talked about the differences between Canadians and Americans and traced them back to the fact that we had a violent revolution and Canada did not in order to separate, in order to achieve the same goal, which is separation from the English monarchy. And I, 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 I'd love to find the article again because it sort of traced the history of violence in this country as coming from that initial foundational violence. Mm -hmm that makes it, you know, okay to kill somebody in an eye for an eye, a life for a life. When you had the, uh, the revolution that went on, there was a lot of violence on the civilian level between people who were loyalists and who were not loyalists. And a lot of people wound up moving to Canada too, you know, that were loyalists. And but the fact is we had a war, Canada did not. Canada managed to negotiate separation. Uh, yeah. We didn't we bother. Also, we had wars like the French and Indian Wars. Yeah. We had wars with uh, Canada. And Canada beat us, didn't they? And <laughs> so I'm just saying we uh, we have a history. We're, we're always most vicious, most bloody, and most aggressive toward our own neighbors, I think. And I'm really not quite sure why we're that way. I, I just don't know. Well, but there's a, there's another part to this, and that is that people enjoy these uh, executions. They enjoy that the hangings. Um, when when you go to the museums in Montgomery, you will see pictures of everybody coming in their Sunday best to see somebody getting hung, uh, and they would uh, bring. The, you know, the lunch. They have lunch on the grounds and watch this guy swinging. Um, so there's something not very nice about us. In England. Um, maybe that's what our original sin is. But um, the same thing back in England. When they had the uh, beheadings, everybody came. Yeah. And they clapped and yeah. carried on. And it was a revolution. time. Think of the France and the revolution. Come on. Well, I, I wonder, I mean, I, I imagine there are a number of things operating there, but you, going to an execution dressed up, feeling like you're on the side of God, there's a certain self-righteousness there. Mm -hmm. And there's also kind of the, well, the fascination with the macabre. You know, that why why is it that people go to movies that have violence and all these things in it? There there does seem to be a fascination with violence that a lot of people have, but I also think it's a self righteous thing. Like we've got them, you know, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, and we got them, and we're we're the good guys, and this is the bad guy. It lets it's, off the hook. It lets us off the hook. Case we don't have to look at what's happening. You're right, self righteousness. We're absolved. And I think even the people being nice, you know, in those last 14 hours, it's easy to all of a sudden show kindness when you know that person is only going to be there a short while. 
I mean, that's an easy moment in which to show kindness. And that's why I, I agree with Jenny that that quote was just really sad. You know, we don't care about the living. We make a big deal. A lot of people make a big deal about, you know, pro-life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Where was anybody pro-life for this, these fellows early on? Well, and, and I want to say about that with them, the people there, uh, you know, right before the execution, you know, a lot of times I would imagine some of those people are moved to, you know, uh, think about their maker at that time, you know, well, we're here witnessing this and, uh, you know, it's too late we can't do anything about it. I mean, I would be thinking that. I wouldn't show up there, number one. Uh, oh, it's wrong. Oh, it's wrong. I'm just not in that place. Uh, but um, I could imagine they were all probably feeling pretty bad, I hope. I, I mean, that's scary. But anyway. When I was in Mississippi, I took two visits to Park big state penitentiary out in the middle of Mississippi Delta is probably about 45 minute drive from where we lived and it is a big scary place it is cold it is uh, just very institutional I did not go on death row either the two times I went the chaplain that I went with who was my deacon at my church was a death row chaplain um, one of my visits was just before execution though that took place and I remember commenting to him that it seemed like everybody was a little uptight and, and I had not had much experience at all, save for going to visit people in local jail, which is a different environment in, in several ways. And he told me, he said, you perceived correctly, just kind of like in the book, because he says, it's amazing that as harsh as these guards can be, and sometimes harshness is justified. Sometimes, like in the book, they go over the top. But he said, it's amazing when you are directly or indirectly, quote, and this was his term, getting your hands dirty, it, it, it puts the whole event itself, putting of taking someone's life into a whole different perspective. And, and, and then a few years later, the one time I've heard Brian Stevenson speak in person, you know, from this book, it's clear, I mean, he even says this in the book, he's, he's, he's against the death penalty, he does not like people to die, but even he has said, and he alludes to it in the book, but he said to a crowd, he said, the death penalty as it's designed in the statutes has, is, is fairly drawn up in theory. The problem with the death penalty is that it's never orchestrated according to the theory, and the people who were so adamant about it are the ones farthest away from getting their hands dirty in the whole problem. Mm -hmm. and, and I kept thinking of those words every time uh, I kept reading these chapters and, and those words and like any line that stuck with you is, yeah, I mean, maybe there's a little more, there's a little guilt. Why can't we do this? Where are these people when, when he was going through all these other struggles in life? But I think that's part of our humanity is when we come face to face with something like that and we realize even if it's just a very small part that we're complicit in and it changes the, the, the entire tenor and it makes it where the humanity comes out in it much more than it does that this is just about punishing someone. And the last thing I'll say, and then I'm going to let y'all take this wherever we want to go after this, it, the, the other line that stuck with me is John's gospel is when, uh, the Jewish leaders are arguing about what to do with Jesus. The high priest Caiaphas makes the statement that ultimately it is better and will help satisfy things and calm things down if one person was to die for the people. And, and I just go back and say, you know, it, it, it's scripture throughout history, all the way back to recorded history, there's always been this sense, someone used the word scapegoat, this sense that if we shed blood, somehow things will be made right. And I, I hear that in a lot of people who speak about 
the death penalty. And I'm like, I don't know if shedding blood from a moral, theological, ethical standpoint is ever something that ever makes things right. Um, and so it, it, that, that, that has always stuck with me is, um, and the line that he uses, why do we think it's okay to kill someone who kills another person? And then he uses the line that says, why don't we rape someone who's raped someone? Or why don't we uh, abuse someone who's abused someone? But kill someone who's killed someone. Well, I'm against it, against the death penalty, but when I read about a crime like we had in Oak Ridge this week where someone stuffed somebody in a freezer, I think, well, what? <laughs> maybe, maybe the death penalty is a good idea, and I usually control myself, but <laughs> I have to say, there, you know, every once in a while you hear about a really horrendous crime and you think just sticking them in a prison maybe isn't enough but what do you do yeah yeah i mean there's some unspeakable things out there and, and i know from hearing from a couple of pastor friends who uh do some stuff with oak ridge police um, those police officers who responded that particular call, I mean, they're, they're going to have to go through counseling and therapy after what they've seen. I guess um, so. My, my father had a case when he was working that he saw that, uh, he, and he saw a lot of things over his 30 years of being a policeman. There was one, one case in which he saw where he apparently just never got over it for the rest of his life. And, and those are the type of things where, all of us have the reactions like, and I do think that a lot of times there is something in the back of my mind that says, something's got to make this right. Plus this is awful. And I think that's part of the scene where this whole, you know, punishment need that comes in, something that that awful needs to be made right. But, but then, you know, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Yep. I don't know. It's very tough. To let go of some of those awful things, but we have to to trust indeed that He is the Lord. Yeah. Well, do you think there's a difference though between okay this murder in a bridge this week where they know who did it, they know where the body was, they I mean they. They don't have to concoct any evidence whatsoever. And put that against the crime that Macmillan was accused of. They didn't know, there was no real evidence. So they went out of their way to fabricate evidence. They went out of their way to ignore people who would have exonerated them from the beginning. And to me, there's a huge difference between those two of course, crimes and how they were solved or pretend to be solved. I mean, so I don't know. I kind of come towards capital punishment for some kinds of horrible crimes where there's absolutely no question about the evidence. We don't get to pick and choose. Well, that, isn't that why you have judges? Isn't that why you have a jury? I mean, isn't it? Yeah, you get to pick and choose. Not not all crimes are the same. I mean, that's why they get adjudicated. That's why you have, you know, a lot of people in for life. A lot of people I, in for life. I I think that those people have some serious mental, and I'm not saying that makes it okay. For them to do that of course i don't mean that but um they had to be insane sane people don't do stuff like that and i i wouldn't want to have to be the one to say just kill them i mean i i can't i can't you know, I might have said that 20, 30, 40 years ago myself during my, you know, real immature days, but I, I just, I mean, and, and I, I mean, that really, really bothered me. 
and I just found out a friend of my daughter's got murdered. So I hate this stuff, but it's life. And um, I just start praying for the, I, I you know, for me, I, I believe I need to start praying for those people that did the killing too. And the victim. I, I, I mean, we don't need to keep adding the hatred I think, um, because life, you know, life is hard enough for people and um, sending out negative messages and hatred's not gonna make anything better. It'll just make it go away for a little while, but it's not going away. And, you know, I have a lot of time right now to reflect on these things. Um, I can't even believe I'm saying all this because I'm not one to just speak out. But this is, a, this is something that is very important to me right now. So anyway, sorry if I sound like I'm making a speech. <laughs> Fine, Connie. But I would ask, is it... Can you have a judgment without hatred? You're, you're e equating capital punishment with hatred. I mean, even the, you know, the fellow on the cross next to Jesus said, I deserve this punishment, but you don't. So, you know, just because someone, I mean, to play devil's advocate, just because someone comes down and says, this is, a horrible crime and deserves punishment is not necessarily an act of hate. Okay, yeah. it is an act of hate when you fabricate evidence and you know you're fabricating that now that's very yeah. hateful and much of what goes on in this book is yeah. based on hate. Well let me rephrase it might not be surface hatred but you're not feeling love. That's good. Okay where's the love? You may not be outraged, but there's something inside that tells you that's okay. We can't pretend that that's okay. There, I was. I don't think something and, came to mind when uh, with the Amish. That I don't know if you remember uh, a decade or so ago, there was a man that shot some Amish school children in a schoolroom. Mm -hmm. And the parents of those kids and the families of those kids approached him and said that they didn't want vengeance. And they mm -hmm. actually embraced this man and told him that they did not care. You know, like I said, it's the Lord. Lord is one that, you know, the Lord is vengeance is the Lord. It's not ours. And they offered this man, you know, a lot of love and stuff like that. I, I, I mean, I was just, when I saw this, I was like, this is just so different than what a lot of people feel they have a right to respect. Mm. And it is according to a Christian, you know, belief system, but it's not necessarily the Christian belief system that a lot of our laws are based on. So. And it was that just to echo what you just said of that story of the book with Herbert or the, the aunt of, of that young girl killed in that bomb explosion. Um, that, that lie, I have to look it up. She said, you know, I'm not grieving for the man, but, I, but I'm not, uh, you know, but I, I'm not celebrating it either. And, and we don't need to be doing any more grieving or killing over this. Um, it, 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 in the context of, of somebody who, you know, in the African-American community, in a community, obviously, that was uh, regarded in uh, you know, is definitely outside the, the power structure or on top of that for someone to say that and speak that kind of powerful truth in the midst of something is is very telling and um, you know a couple of y'all have referenced you know, the eye for the eye I always tell people when when that comes up in scripture that you know the eye for the eye rule and, and of course the Old Testament is notorious for Lots of killing. God, <laughs> lots of killings done in the Old Testament. But whenever somebody's stoned or somebody's executed for something, the 
you pay attention to those stories, it's the whole community, does it? And in fact, it's often the victim who was the one who, who is the first one to pick up the stone. So when Jesus says that to all of the Pharisees who've taken the adulterous woman, let those without sin cast the first stone, um, he's turning that whole idea of, you know, we kill, you know, to, to punish crimes up on its head. And um, it, it, it's just, you know, kind of, to me, this, this idea of, of the, the, capital, the capital punishment of this punishment in general, human eyes are always going to make mistakes. But our vigilance is how do we make sure that as best as human beings can do it, how can justice be impartial in the eyes of human beings? And, and certainly this story illustrates that race and socioeconomic status have a huge effect upon that. And in our culture, and, and this is the, old, the whole issue with our conversations and racism, besides just all of the differences and the prejudices, is because we live in separate communities, we're separated in so many different ways, not just physically, but uh, in how we socialize and, and whatnot. It's so much easier to say, well, that group can be punished for something, or they can be scapegoated because we don't get our hands dirty for it. And, and I think it's, if you've read along in the book and, or watched the movie, you kind of figure out that, that, that it's a theme that he's going to develop in this and part of his work that he continues to do with the EJI, the Equal Justice Institute. Um, got about 10 minutes. Just again, other thoughts. I have well, one other one, but I want to let y'all talk unless nobody wants to talk. Go ahead. Well, I, it seems to me when I read about something like this latest one in Oak Ridge, I start thinking about these people. How did they get that way? And we have, I think, a responsibility in society to make sure that people don't get that way. Um, I mean, uh, it will be interesting to find out Uh-oh. <laughs> Judy, we lost you. Oh. All right. She'll come back. Anyone else want to pick up? You know, if if when people can't get through, if they can type their idea in the chat, we could at least see that, maybe. Yeah. Well, I think it's mental health is what she was talking about. That sometimes people need mental health earlier in their lives and they don't they don't get it we don't have ready access to this and and they grow up and they endure probably enormous hurts we don't know and they carry them forward and they hurt others so and there doesn't seem to be the resources <clears throat> to identify these issues. And um, there used to be mental hospitals. There aren't mental hospitals. They turned into real monstrous places. places. We're lucky we have Ridgeview here. But a lot of places don't have anything like that. So, I think that's what's motivating some of these um, groups that want to change policing and to redirect resources towards yeah, some of these. Absolutely, absolutely. In New York City, for example, if you have someone who uh, they have, uh, I had a, a friend of my son's um, who was threatening to kill herself and he was in a position where he could not contact the police in New York City, and he asked me to. So I got hold of the police, but they said, if it's a suicide attempt or someone who is, has mental issues, they send a group that are not dressed in police uniforms, and 
these people go and then they assess the situation, talk to the person. If a police uh, in unit is needed, they then call the police. But the initial responders to someone who's sick or flipping out or whatever it is, is not to have the police show up. And I really think that that's an extremely good point right. to make is that you do not need to have armed policemen, you know, this to be able to show up with somebody that's suicidal. And you hear a lot about death by cop where people want to kill themselves, but don't really want to shoot themselves, but want the police to shoot them. And how many situations do you have where people go out and do a lot of, you know, a mass killing and then shoot themselves. So you're kind of like, you know, I mean, you're right that there's mental issues, but you need a whole different setup. And there are countries that really have, and like granted they're different societies, they're smaller, they don't have the same history we do, but these places either do not have prisons or don't have the level of violence we do or don't have these sorts of shootings. It's just, you know, I'm getting off on a tangent, I apologize. But that thought got to me that there's a need for different types of intervention. De-escalation, that's the term. Good idea. By the way, I did get hold of the police and, she, <laughs> and they had a unit that went there. So I mean, it worked out, but it was weird that I had to try to get through 911 in the city outside your area and to call, uh, I had to do four or five phone calls, but I did get hold of the, of the precinct where the lady was. And, anyway. Good for you, Deb. Thank oh. you. Thank you. And one of the things that's 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 just amazing to me, and it's not surprising to use Jim's word earlier, but it just it still is just baffles your mind to think about is the prison population. Talk about we've talked about the disparity with white and black, but the fact that he you know and, and I looked independent stats up, and he's right around twenty to twenty five percent of the prison population are veterans, um, people who serve their country. Um, people who have uh, sacrificed have been in combat. Uh, the story of Herbert just, I mean, the part that even broke my heart more than his words at the end there were the fact his newlywed wife, he was so worried about making sure she got that flat. You know, here's a man being executed by the state, but he very much wants his widow to get this flag. And Go back to what I said earlier, you know, does this killing someone make killing justified? Um, I think the response that I, I've heard from y'all and that just keeps coming to me from this book is what we're called to do is just to show humanity even in the face of inhumanity. And from a gospel standpoint, to show the love of God even in the midst of profound darkness and despair. Um, I'll share one more story and then I'll be quiet and let y'all finish the last few minutes. Um, I know a friend of mine who was in New York at 9-11, uh, got out of the Twin Towers, lost several co-workers who did not make it out, and got, um, I can't remember if it was this, the state of New York or if it was the federal government, got subpoenaed to talk about because apparently she had actually witnessed the plane flying in and it had made that known but uh, some attorney uh, asked her you know for these hijackers if if we were to capture any of their accomplices obviously the hijackers were killed would you support the death penalty in that and she, she kind of paused for a second and said um, is, is evil in action that was with what happened on 9-11 um that doesn't make us a whole lot better just to just to demand blood and and, and i'm and again I, i'm very sympathetic to people who've been the victim of a crime who who speak out both you know who were who were out of their anguish want justice done in the form of taking the life but also don't want that kind of justice done and it just seems to me that as we try to figure out what it means to 
deal with racism, to deal with all the divisions in our society, that one of the solutions to it is is to try, despite maybe our own desire for that kind of justice, to pursue um, an alternative form of justice that still seeks to honor the humanity of even the worst people and the worst crimes that have been committed. Um, because again, we don't know. It, even the biggest terrorist is a child of God, and that's that's a very hard thing to say. Um, people who have who have uh, some of the people that came in front of my mom's court who abused children, they are still children of God, even though they did some awful things. Um, I, I will stop with that thought. We've got five minutes. Any other comments or thoughts before I wrap it up? I was sort of been thinking about some of that. What do we think of the way they treat real people who were convicted justifiably of some some offense which put them on on death row? What do we think of how they're treated? I mean, I found it horrible. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, because you don't hear much discussion of it. Well, if, if that's not a southern problem, a racist problem. That's no. not every place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll share some of my experience. I'm working on uh, in a maximum security prison um, on what you all would call death row, but we don't have the death penalty, so they were every single person in this facility was a lifer, um, and when I first went in, I said. I don't want to know what what they did. They're just, they're gonna be people, they're gonna be clients. Um, but what you will find out is that they want to tell you, they will tell you what they did. Um, and Stockton Jail in Edinburgh is every bit like as described. The, uh, the little cells, the stone walls, the no heat, the no air, the tiny little, you know, it's, it's like being in a castle. Um, and, you know, small, small, small rooms where they spend a lot of time and then um, not much available for, for recreation and, uh, and pretty, pretty heartless treatment, food, food and, um, some some of what I have I've, I've read I've read in this brought some of those memories back to me. You know, this is a thing that I did when I was young and willing to volunteer for things like this. Um, but it brought some of it back and really shook me up when I said, "Oh yes, I remember this," and I remember some some of the um, some of the prisoners who clearly. If they had got, you know, if they had not come from disadvantaged backgrounds, if they had recent reasonable counsel, good solicitors, um, they would have surely gotten off on incompetence grounds. A lot of them should have been in uh, mental facilities. They should have been, you know, they're mental prisons uh, long term. Um, they, they really didn't get any better treatment than because they were, you know, poor Scottish workers doesn't mean that they, they were getting any better treatment than people in Alabama. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. For a more up uplifting theme, I keep wondering, this, this author is truly a remarkable person. I mean, he went to Harvard and got two degrees simultaneously, yeah. coming from a reasonably That's very odd. unknown That's very university. And I had to wonder, was he the beneficiary of affirmative action? Why did Harvard accept this guy, who's truly remarkable, and became a real leader in the country? It's a remarkable story. He was a good writer. Is, yeah. <laughs> he was obviously very bright and very committed. You can't go to the Kennedy School. Our son went there. It's very hard. You have to have good parents, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> and then go, go to law school, too. 
It's I amazing. Mean, I mean, th both of those are so hard because I've known people at both of them. It's incredible. To carry both loads is, yeah. is extraordinary. I'd like to know more about the story. Yeah. You can you can look him up on YouTube, and he and he's as good a speaker as he is. A writer. Oh, I I know, but how did it happen? I mean, how does somebody from a, an unknown university someplace yeah. get into these Harvard it's and black Canadian? university? It's unknown because it's black. It doesn't mean it's bad. I didn't say that. No, but it I, might have been affirmative. I I imagine there was some affirmative action. Oh no, yeah, uh, that, uh, that, there was at that point. Yeah student body and he would be, you know, ideal to be bringing in. Getting political, I often wonder, well, how did Clarence Thomas get where he was without affirmative action? Yet he's one of I, I, I have to that. say, uh, I think it was God, you know, God works in mysterious ways. There's miracles happening all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I encourage you to go look at some of his talks on YouTube, and, and and just as you figured out with this book, his talks are very challenging, too. But uh, it's not it's not somebody ranting and raving. It's somebody who's both lived the experience and who really has done a lot of work to make strides in creating equal justice. Paul too. Yeah. He likes he likes to speak to groups of kids. Um, my grandson Thomas heard him speak to a. A black high school graduation group, and you know, he really and how they had some. They were in a particularly good school, and that they've had ex, uh, some good experiences and uh, better education than a lot of other black kids have, and so therefore they need to go out and do something for other people. I mean, that's the way he talked. Really, you have to have a Kleenex with you when you hear a dog. Yeah. Well, on that note, friends, we have hit our time. Uh, so for next time, chapters five, six, and seven, it's about the same length as three and four. Um, and again, as you, those of you who are uh, new to this or do not have the book, you can definitely follow along with the discussion. It just, you get a lot more context with the book. So I encourage you to get it and read it. Um, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you to those of you watching this later on YouTube. Appreciate all your comments. And we continue to grow in this conversation. And as I said, the, the book doesn't get any easier as we go along. That's if you've already read ahead, <laughs> you'll figure that out. But but the book does get, and, and I like, thank you, Joe, for you know saying, yeah, uplifting thing here at the end. The book does shine a lot of light in the midst of some very hard and dark places. Mm -hmm. and And I think that's both good not just not make us feel horrible from reading it but also it reminds me that if we engage the work of doing this kind of justice work out in the community and in the world that there will be some fruitful labor and fruitful reward come from it and we continue to work to see how we may do that as a parish and what that's going to look like so until next time thank you all again and look forward thank to next you. week with you